Yo. What's up? Yeah. Oh, damn. This guy's got all the Jack Jumpers gear. What's up? Yeah, the, the two things I own, I'm wearing. <laughs> Um, thank you for thank you for coming on. Um, we appreciate it. I know we know it's time consuming, but um, oh, thank no, you. Thomas, mate. Right, so we'll start off with Tazzy. Um, let us know how the situation's down there. Obviously, it's a new franchise. Very exciting times for the NBL and for all the Jack Jumpers players. Um, how's the squad looking and feeling? How's the vibe down there? Man, it's unbelievable. Um, you know, trying to get a whole team from scratch in from essentially most people from over the either overseas overseas or from you know the mainland. It's um it's been a, a hell of a work in progress and, you know, everyone in the office and the coaching staff have done a phenomenal job to, to get this to where it's at. And um, now we've got everyone in town and we've started practice and, you know, it's ramping up. We've got the blitz coming up in a couple of weeks and then December 3rd's uh, creeping up very quickly as well. So um, yeah, we're, we're balls to the wall right now. Sure. I'm sure there's a lot of new Jack Jumpers fans watching right now. Um, I was discussing with Hesh about the next star, Nikita. Um, I had a weird feeling about him. He's going to be a promising, good player. Um, talk to us about him, um, for, especially for those who might not know much about him. Yeah, I mean, that kid can hoop. He's a, he's a flat-out baller. Um, he's only a young tucker. Um, only speaks, you know, a little bit of English. Um, you know, coming from Russia as a 21-year-old, you know, I, I always put myself in his shoes. What would I be like if I was 21 over in Russia right now? And he's doing much better than I would be doing. Sure. Um, he's coming out of his shell a little bit, but yeah, he's, he showed his talents from day one and you know, that, that kid's got everything. So great passer, great vision, good court knowledge, um, can shoot the ball, uh, post up game, mid range game. He's got the lot. So, you know, very exciting to see him play and actually get out there on the court and, uh, show the NBL what he can do. Yeah, for sure. I, I messaged you as well about your, your point guard. I'm, I'm going to get the get the name wrong. Is it Maggetti or Maget? Josh, how do you uh, say it? It's Maget, so wrong yeah. twice. But, wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Josh Maget, obviously, uh, we were looking at his tape when we were doing like a rundown of some of the teams, and, and I think he slept on a little bit as an import coming in. Like he looks like a, a super nice passer, and, and, and that's what you mentioned as well. Talk to us a little bit about being in the backcourt with him. How's that been? Yeah, it's been great. Um, like you say, some of his passes at practice, you know, he had one to Jack McVeigh the other day. He was not looking, threw it around three people and Jack was like, whoa, before he even caught it. So, um, you know, I think we ended the practice on that pass. And yeah, it's not just that, man, the, the guy can score as well. Um, everyone knew about his passing coming in, but this guy's got deep range. Um, I think he grills me about three times at practice, hitting nothing but net. So that's always been fun. And um, yeah, he's just a, he's a great floor general. Uh, he's going to lead the guys, you know, on the court. And, um, yeah, I can't wait to learn from him. Yeah, that's, that's dope, man. What about what about from yourself, individual standpoint? We had a bit of an interrupted off-season. I know we planned to get in a bit of work in Sydney and obviously the lockdown messed us up a little bit. Um, how are you feeling from an individual standpoint in terms of your preparation and, and what's your mentality going in for yourself? Yeah, it's been good. Like I said, um, you know, we planned to put in a lot of work this, this off-season and, you know, did what we could on those outdoor courts in the sun and in the wind before I kicked the ball over the fence. And then, um, yeah, it's been good. So to finally get down here, get through quarantine, get all the stuff, get my car off the boat, you know, get the removalists in, all that to be to be settled in and, you know, putting in a really good preseason with the coaches here. Um, they got a really big focus on development. Uh, Scott Ross being great, defining guys' roles and, you know, putting guys in their best position to score. So, um, you know, once we put all that together and, you know, get that camaraderie going, um, I think it's going to be a really good year for us. Um, obviously, being on t uh, being in Tasmania with the new franchise, we touched on it at the start. Um, how is the experience shaping up, giving everything that's said about you being an NBL player and the player you are, um, high character, great culture and locker room guy? Um, how have you installed that into the Tasmanian Jack Jumpers um, franchise? It's just been exciting, um, you know, to build to build a team up from nothing um, and really set the tone from a culture standpoint. It's been it's been really a lot of fun. Um, we had a, a no dickhead policy, um, the club signing everyone. And, you know, that's that's shown leaps and bounds. Uh, we put a lot of focus into that side of it. Um, we had camp up uh, up north of Tassie, you know, a couple of weeks ago. We were down the community guys doing two promos a day. Um, and there was just a huge buzz around the town. So, you know, we got to do right by the people down here. They've been wanting this team for, you know, when I was playing in 2016 with the Chargers, they were they were already super keen to have a team. And um, now it's finally here. So we got to do right by them. And, 
you know, bring, bring a team culture that represents Tasmania and, you know, what this state is all about. And um, I think we're going to do that. Um, let's go back in time, obviously born in Melbourne, um, where basketball is obviously um, a popular sport. Did you play any other sports and how did you get into basketball? Yeah, I mean, I played everything growing up. Uh, basketball, cricket, AFL, rugby, uh, soccer for a little bit. Um, I had my hand in everything, a little bit of athletics. Um, but yeah, my brother was playing it uh, when I was a young kid, when I was about six or seven. And then, uh, yeah, just grew from there, playing with friends and you know, all through high school, that was pretty much why I played. It's just my group of friends really loved it and we just loved hooping. So, it, um, yeah, it kind of just grew from there. Yeah, I'm glad that you touched on that. I was just going to ask you about, you moved to Sydney, obviously, from Melbourne and then ended up at Barker College, which is a, a pretty renowned school for, for basketball and the CAS competition is pretty highly held. How was that school experience like? I remember you guys being super dominant and just being known around the state as probably one of the best high school teams around. How was that whole whole thing looking back on that time? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a phenomenal time. We we just had a blast. Um, speaking of tough pre-seasons, we had a run and gun offense, um, full court press, full 40 minutes, um, and then try and score the ball pretty much as quickly as you could. So uh, we were running every day. We, we'd come in, we'd do extras, we'd get in it you know, 6.30 before school, everyone was just keen to keep running and running and running. And um, like you said, we ended up winning the, the CAS um, competition. And then we went all the way to state where we got beaten by a very good Westfield Sports Heights uh, team. Uh, Who was on that team? A few professional play? players. Uh, Paul Brotherson was in that team. Jason Kadee. Um, yeah. I think he had about 20 points in the first quarter. And you know, kind of blew us out of the water a little bit. We were a little bit out of our depth against uh, against the sports school. But, um, yeah, it was a great experience and uh, still still good friends with a lot of those guys. Nice. And then, and then obviously, Youth League, that's where I, I first met you and we, we were hooping together. Me and you combined for, for 40 a game. You had 27. <laughs> I probably went for about three. How were those years, man? Still 40. Yeah, what exactly. Those years were fun, man. I was thinking about, I was talking to someone about it the other day um, and just reminiscing about it, man. Like, obviously, yeah, for me, that was my first taste of structured basketball and, and being around guys like yourself who had been in an environment like that for years. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on those times? And are you still keeping in touch with a few of the guys from, from back in the day? Yeah, I mean, it was just a, like you said, it was just a fun time. That Those youth league years were, um, you know, they, they were a great, great time of life, you know, straight out of school and, just tooping with your mates again. Um, we had a really good squad, you know, like you, Cookie, Josh Mack, and you know, Housey was there, and you know, it was um, it was just a blast, man. I, I remember those times very well, and you know, hanging out at Dom's house out on the other side of Barker, just having a few beers before going to the pub, and yeah, it was um, it was a really fun time. Sure. Um, you then to continue to rise up to the ranks uh, within the semi-professional Waratah League or ABA. Don't ask me about the New South Wales leagues. They're all confusing to me. Um, putting up huge numbers with horns. There's only then, one. Oh, I, there is only one? Yeah, they just change names. Man. They, it uh, just uh, seems to change names every year. Now it's the Waratah League, but it used to be called the ABA. That's like, Okay. I know what Waratah League is, so that makes yeah, sense. Just that, yeah. yeah. Um, putting up huge numbers with Hornsby and then Norths, um, earning yourself a DP role with the Kings. Um, explain how your first pro experience is like and how did the Kings reach out? Um, so yeah, it was uh, pretty lucky. Uh, Tim Hudson was on our team who ended up being the assistant coach of the uh, Sydney Kings that year. Um, and, and he took me along to the development tryout, um, essentially where a few, a few of the local contracted guys are playing and, um, yeah, played well and, and managed to get a, a development role with the Kings. Um, seems like an eternity ago now, but, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a very different time back then. Um, DPs didn't get paid and, you know, obviously he was still doing promos back then. And, you know, it was, it was a great experience. I mean, I learned a lot through my development years and, you know, from to see where I started as a development player to the conditions they have now is just, it's great what the league has done and, you know, giving those guys a chance to not only be in their home state, but to go to other States, you know, create more, more job opportunities for development players. has just been really good. Yeah. It's, it's, it's cool that you, you mentioned that. Cause I was just about to say, I think one of your, your route has been one of the most unorthodox and I would say toughest climbs to an NBL roster spot. Um, most people I speak to within the industry know about it and they know that the journey you've been on. And I'd say you're one of the pioneers of that development player and, and justifying the fact that development players probably should be 
paid and they put in the same amount of work and some of them are actually really good basketball players so they should actually be rewarded for that i know you spent a fair few years as a trainer with the kings doing everything you possibly could i, I still remember times when we were all just around like playing at north thinking why isn't this guy signed yet picked up a nickname called contract killer and you're killing all the guys with contracts and you never had one and then obviously went to germany and you're just bouncing around trying to get that contract Talk to us about the, the mental grind of that man year after year, just feeling like you're, you're there and you're, you're putting up numbers and you're killing a practice, but just never actually getting that contract for the, for a few years when you were there. Yeah. I mean, it was tough. Um, not getting that, that gig from the development after my last year when I, I got too old um, to be a development player anymore and, you know, didn't get that job and, and, and stayed on as a training player. Um, and like you said, managed to, to play pretty well in those sessions and, and got an injury replacement job for a couple of games late in the season. Um, but yeah, didn't really get on too much or having a chance to, to kind of show my stuff too much. Um, but yeah, always had fun on those scout teams as a development player. So go out and try and be Rodney Clark or you know Bryce Cotton these days and just go out and shoot every shot and play with that confidence. It was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, went on a China trip. Uh, to represent you know Australia in the NBL and with a few of the guys and managed to play you know had a great tournament um you know probably one of the leading scorers in that tournament ended up getting a job the German coach over there said I've got a spot for you in my team um if you want one and I you know jumped at the opportunity go live in Germany went home spoke to spoke to my wife Michelle and was like yo well, I'm moving to Germany in three weeks so um <laughs> that was a fun that was a fun experience. Um, but yeah, then that coach ended up changing teams, going to a different team, had another guy who they brought up. Um, you know, we didn't have a great season, but had a lot of fun. You know, again, met a lot of great guys who I still keep in contact with now. And uh, once all that was over and, you know, got back into town, Bevo said, come down to uh, Illawarra and, and come train with those guys. And, you know, Flinny was there. He was a big advocate for me um, going through those times. And, you know, Reese Martin got injured four days before the season started and Bevo called me into his office and said, hey, we want you to, to play these first four games. Um, and then, you know, managed to play well in those first four games. I remember up in Cairns, we played there the first game, uh, ended up playing big minutes in the fourth quarter, finished the game and then played in overtime as well. So, um, you know, for Bevo to have that trust in me, you know, from a pretty limited preseason compared to everyone else um, to, you know, go through that and, you know, carry on that journey. And he fought for me tooth and nail to, to have the club sign me for the rest of the year. And, and that managed to happen. And um, yeah, it's kind of just blossomed from there. For sure. You're not the first person to say that about, about Bevo. He's obviously a, a player's coach and well-respected in, in the NBL community. So yeah, you mentioned you signed with the Hawks as an injury replacement. You, you left us high and dry at us at our Saturday Auburn competition, man. That 20 grand, I was waiting for my Christmas gifts if we won that comp. But anyway, don't worry, I'm not holding it against you. Sorry, man. I can only average 50, 10, and 10 for a while. <laughs> how did that How did that feel, though, that first full-time gig, man? Obviously, the birth of Agent 97, getting a few of your trademark dunks out on the break. Talk us through that time and how exciting it was to finally, I guess, I don't know, it felt like for me anyway, kind of being on your journey or, or with you along the way, it felt like finally this guy's getting the respect he deserves in the NBL. Talk us about that, how it all kind of came full circle and what that felt like. Yeah, I mean, it, it was great, um, you know, to have that nickname kind of coined by Tom Hurts down in Melbourne, um, a journalist for the NBL. And then Kirk Penny kind of just said it in, in jest in a, in a halftime or a full-time interview um, on the TV. It kind of just blew up from there. Um, and again, just to have a guy like Bevo to pretty much say, go out there, be you. You know, if you're open, shoot it. If you don't shoot it, come sit down. So um, to have that confidence and get out, we were a fast team. Again, we had a lot of a lot of great guys on that Illawarra team. Um, to start my NBL journey with the team of that calibre, um, I think really set me up for my career, um, how I view the game, you know, the culture side of it. Guys like, you know, living with Kev and, and Cody and AJ and all everyone on that team, man, we were, we were all in and, you know, it was just a it was just a great way to start my career. Um, you then signed with Cairns, uh, Breakers, Kings, and obviously now Tasmania. Um, are you officially a vet? <laughs> I think if you played for five teams in the league, you're, you're pretty close to being a vet. Um, 
Yeah, I get I get called the old fella now, so um, I think that's another another feather in the cap for being a veteran. Yeah, for sure. Um, briefly describe um, what it's like to be part of so many clubs and how and what it's like to see the NBL grow into what it is today. Oh, I mean, <laughs> from ten years ago when I started to to right now, what the NBL is is just a completely different league. Um, what Larry's done to to put this league to where it is, where you know you got NBA scouts and coaches and teams watching these guys and you know playing the preseason against against NBA teams and having that worldwide perspective of what the NBL is and, you know, what these guys can do is, is just great. Um, yeah. It's just been like Hesh said, it's been a hell of a ride. I've, I've managed to play for some great coaches, you know, Bevo, Shane Hill, Fernie, you know, Dan Shamir last year uh, for the last couple of years, Kevin Brad as well. Um, and now Scott Roth. It's just like, being able to, to soak up what those guys have, what their philosophies are and, you know, kind of churn that around. And now that's sort of molded how I view the game and, you know, the things I hold important and what, you know, I, I don't like so much about the game. So um, to be able to just essentially be a sponge and learn something new from those guys every single year, it's just, um, yeah, it's really elevated, you know, the game to me as a whole. Yeah, nice. I um talking about the NBA and how they got involved. Obviously, Larry was was a big advocate for the the NBL NBA crossover experience, and you you partook in that for uh, I think months was it just with the Breakers or was it was it twice? Twice with the Breakers, yeah. So we played Phoenix the first year. We um we ended up losing by five points. Uh, we had a shot. I think Corey had a shot to tie the game within the last minute and yeah. uh, just rimmed out, and then they went down and got a score, but um. How was that whole thing with the going over to the States and being around NBA organizations? And what did you kind of learn from, from that? It's crazy, man. <laughs> what I learned is they have a lot of money <laughs> and uh, they spend it very wisely. You know, they got laundry bins full of Gatorades. They got, you know, they got the full laundry service inside. They, they got MRI machines. They got everything. They got trainers on tap. They got a bloody drill bit containers just full of every single different type of gum you know just little things like that they got socks whenever they want they got all the gear um i remember with phoenix they just you know we're like oh can we get a t-shirt or something and then you go to the hotel room and there's just 50 shirts and 100 pairs of socks and they're just like oh yeah you can have all this um so yeah just you know that that next level over there it's just it's it's a crazy thing it really is um, did you want to mention the the two and a hash? Oh yeah, I remember that dunk. How did that one feel going down the lane? Someone jumped with you. They must not have known, man. This this guy can can take off that left foot. Do you remember that dunk? Oh no, is he <laughs> get that run up in that left foot, man? Anything can happen, right? You go up there, jump as high as you can, hope for the best. Um, yeah, that was that was cool. Um, it's always nice to get a dunk, um, especially on some centers. So uh, caught a few people in the league. Um, been around for a little bit, so. Um, I got, a, I got Plumley with a good one last year. I remember uh, that one against two years ago now. Um, but yeah, that was quite a few people, which has been nice. You reckon you, you still got some juice in the legs? Got some this season? Ah, oh, Matt, you'll have to watch the, the Jack Jumpers games and find out. I'll be watching. I'll yeah, be watching. Sure. Right, right. <laughs> um, you also broke into the Boomers team in 2019 uh, to play in the qualifiers. Talk to us through that and putting on the green and gold. Yeah, that was that was a surreal experience. Um, that was my career year that year under, under KB um, coming off the bench, you know, average 10 points a game um, really felt comfortable that year. And, you know, felt like every shot was going down. So um, that was, that was a, just an unreal experience to get that call from, from Copes to say that, you know, I'd made the team and was going on the road and not just going on the road, but going to um, Kazakhstan and Iran um, two places you'd probably never think about going in, in your life. And, you know, to experience that off the court as well as on the court was just just something I'll I'll never forget. And um, you know, you go you go play a run, you're on the bus with the the shades down, and you get out to the arena, and it, it's something out of Iron Man. It's just the mountains in the background, the small arena, and then you get in there two hours beforehand, and the the crowd's full. They're already chanting and blowing their horns, and it's as loud as any game I had, and it was still two hours before tip off. So. Um, yeah, it was just a, it was a crazy experience. That's crazy. Um, we'll get into the future and stuff like that. Apart from continuing to produce in the NBL, 
Um, what other professional goals do you have for yourself within the sport? Uh, just just focusing on that offside. Um, again, the, the culture thing with the jack jumpers this year is a huge part of it. And, um, you know, that, that's a key focus for not just me, but for a lot of the guys. And, you know, the whole organisation is, is leaving something behind that the jack jumpers will carry through. And I think that's something really special. Um, not a lot of guys get to start a franchise up from nothing and build something that can be passed on. So I'm, I'm really excited for that. Yeah, nice. And obviously, congratulations. Recently, made your family of two turned into a family of three with little Freddie. Yeah, uh, did. Yeah, MPA. four months. Four months ago. Four months. So yeah. That's he crazy. Had his, uh, his four month vaccinations today. So he was a little trooper. Um, so yeah, hopefully sleeps it's, through the night tonight. Yeah, that's that's yeah, very shortly in the future, sleep through the night, but later in the future, NBA superstar, is that on the cards? Oh, without a doubt, mate. Yeah. Otherwise, he's not coming home. <laughs> he's, uh, yeah, he's um, yeah. I'm excited just to to get into some games this year, and you know, just every day something different with him. He he seems like he grows a little bit taller. He's just started to smile and laugh now for the last couple of weeks. So um, yeah, waking him up and getting those smiles every day is just it's the best part of the day by far. Nice. Um, we'll get we'll, we'll get into our ten quick questions. This is a little segment at the end of each episode we like to do with our guests. Um, just 10 rapid fire questions. You can use your skip button if you want. First question, what is something you are appreciative of? It can be anything. Uh, my family. Um, my wife especially has sacrificed a lot um, for me to, to play hoops. And um, yeah, I, I think about that all, all the time. Nice. Best basketball shoe you have ever worn? Oh, I said this the other day. It's got to be the sprees, right? Yeah. <laughs> the spinners man yeah. and if it's not those it'll be the pumps i think i don't know if they're the best technically but they got they're the coolest yeah nice um favorite nbl away city oh none of them um <laughs> the, the city itself um considering i've lived in half of them um sydney's always fun to go home and, and play in front of friends and family um you know that's that's awesome to see familiar faces in the crowd and um you know, make eye contact with them and just, yeah, see them after the game. That's the best. Nice. Best player you have ever guarded in your career? Ja Morant, Chris Paul. Do they count? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the NBL, I'd, I'd say Cotton and Randall are, are right up there. Jerome Randall was definitely one of the toughest guys I've, I've ever guarded. To, you know, he had it all that, that mid-range when he's, got his three going it was near impossible kind of just try and stay in front and hope that he misses so um yeah those two for sure um who's the most underrated player you know can be any level most underrated who's someone really good that does doesn't get the the rap they get, they should get man you throw the underrated question straight off the bat um jeez there's a lot of them in the nbl um I'll give you that token answer because, I mean, you yeah, can pass it every you night. And, it. You can pass it if you want. If no one comes to mind. Yeah. No, it's it, seriously, it's it's probably the guys. So we got 12 rostered guys. It's probably the guys 12 to 16 in every team that are the most underrated. Um, yeah. There's a lot of great talent in Australia right now. And those guys that just miss out or become training players are, um, yeah, they, they're very talented guys and they just, they haven't had their shot yet. So. Sure. Good answer. Sure. All right. Start, bench, cut. We had this discussion, me and Reese, on our latest episode that we did when we were just talking hoops. But Bradley Beal, Devin Booker, Donovan Mitchell. Damn. Yeah, I know. Bench, start, cut, hey? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I guess you start start Booker and bring Beal off the bench is what I, I, I think I would say. Um, we, all have, we all have different answers. Cut yeah, and, that, and, and they, even that's a bit tough. You know, I think Beal's one of those guys that somehow scores 40 and still goes under the radar a little bit. Um, yeah, you know, he's been, he's been close to the leading scorer in the league for a couple of years now and just guys still don't know about him. So, um, yeah, he's, he's got to get his chance. For sure. Um, favorite food or meal? Uh, you can't beat a good steak, mate. Yeah. Best you'd agree, right? Yeah. <laughs> My jokes over there, hey? Yeah. 
<laughs> I'm vegetarian, by the way, Reese. That's why. Actually, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, but I didn't know that. You didn't know that? Yeah, that's, that's awesome. crazy. I'm sure Jared remembers. Yep. Um, who's winning the NBA 2022 MVP award? So you got MVP. Yeah. Shit. Whoever play, whoever stays healthy, I think. Mm. Um, yeah, it could be. Could be anyone right now. Hey, um, you got to go with KD, right? Stick with the favorites. Um, yeah. Although Patty Mills seems to be balling out, maybe he'll get a chance. <laughs> yeah. Imagine. That. Imagine. Um, funniest teammate you've ever had. Oh, I've, I've had a lot. Um, Sean Long was was one of the funniest by far. Um, he is an absolute character. Um, you probably wouldn't know it by seeing him on the court and his antics and stuff like that. But uh, off the court, he's he's a funny dude. I've got one for you that you might not be thinking of. Timothy Kovacevic. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Brace, I'm gonna tag him in this as well. Also true. Yeah, he's one of the. I've had, I've had many, many a funny conversation with Tim Kovacevic. Sure. One included drinking a few alcoholic beverages and sitting on a step and discussing vigorously who had a better dad. So um, <laughs> <laughs> we've had some fun times. Amazing. All right, last question. I uh, think. As always, I finish up with a question that's pretty predictable, but I want to hear it from the guest mouth. Who is winning the NBL championship this year? Oh, you can't go past the jack jumpers, mate. Yeah, perfect answer. Good Give answer. it to everyone. What about what about uh, finals MVP? <laughs> oh, Jared Weeks for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's what we like to hear. Hey, man, that's what we want to hear, man. Just say what you're really thinking. <laughs> you know what I mean? All right, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Jared, for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, we'll be rooting for the Jack Jumpers and you this season. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Too easy. Thanks, guys. Too easy. Too easy.